Welcome to Alternative Investing. I'm Mark Bunting, along with my co-host, David Kaufman. He's the president of Westcourt Capital. Now, this is the show where we shift our focus away from stocks and bonds to explore investment concepts that help you break away from the pack and potentially capitalize on some big gains. This week, we'll reflect on the market volatility of the past few weeks and discuss how to build a portfolio for the so-called new normal. Joining us today is Michael Nairn. He's president of Tacita Capital. Nice to see you, sir. Great to be here. So tell us about Tacita Capital. Uh, who are your clients and, and what do you do for them? Well, Tacita Capital is a family office and investment counseling firm. We uh, work on a multidisciplinary basis with affluent families. My partner is actually my spouse who is a tax lawyer and one of our other partners is a CA to help a affluent family manage the household balance sheet over multiple generations. So it's really an integration of wealth planning with portfolio management. Um, the second service we have is just straight portfolio management services called TASAVEST where we've adopted the core and satellite progressive structures out of the U.S. to deliver more diversified, lower cost, more tax effective portfolios in a customized fashion. Let's talk about diversification because, of course, that's a, a term that comes up not only at this show but across the uh, investing universe. Uh, describe the difference in the value of diversifying among assets as compared to diversifying among asset classes. Well, that, that's a great question because we see it all the time. Uh, somebody will you know, come into our office and bring a portfolio in and often it's kind of 30 Canadian stocks. 20 U.S. stocks, a few American depository receipts for the international, a smattering of bonds. And to us, that is a, you know, a very under-diversified portfolio. We'll typically have five major asset classes, cash, fixed income, equities, real assets, and alternatives. But under that, we have 40 sub-asset classes, because bonds can go from short to long, credit, high yield, mortgage pools, equities can be emerging market, real assets can be precious metal infrastructure. So, you know, asset classes take you in this new global world to a much more diversified point. Now, we have, we have two boards on this. The first, if we can bring that up, we're going to talk about, you can identify what these asset classes are, and then we're going to talk about how including multiple asset classes can actually make your portfolio more efficient. So here's the first one. Can you walk us through that? Sure. Um, the, the, uh, the first one is a... Uh, I, we're basically, we're looking at the returns of various asset classes from 01 to 2001. Uh, best performer was uh, the, the REIT index in Toronto, basically. But, but the point here is that uh, the, the, the more diversification... The, the, the more protected you are and you, you get a more reasonable return. Well, yeah, what, what, what occurs is if you move to a broader group of asset classes, you don't have just simply a, the bond and stocks mix, but you end up getting through energy or through REITs or through uh, other assets, the, the, not only the diversification effect, but the opportunity for a higher return. Yeah, so let, let, this is a good time to pull up, to, to pull up sort of the risk return uh, board that we have because th this is a somewhat counterintuitive. Walk us through how it's possible that you add uh, an element to your portfolio that appears to either have very low uh, returns or very high risk, and somehow it makes the portfolio together perform better. If we can bring that up, that'd be great. Sure. Um, when you're looking at a portfolio, and you start with, in this particular case, one asset class like U.S. stocks. Adding a second asset class like international stocks will often bring a diversification effect. In this case, you get a higher return plus lower volatility. Add in a third asset class, which in this case was a kind of a 20% read allocation, you can see that portfolio continuing to have a higher return and again, a lower volatility. Lower volatility. As we see the three asset portfolio there on the left hand side, and then you get the four asset portfolio and that increases the return and lowers the volatility correct that's right yeah. it's almost uh, if you take a look that fourth assets actually commodities if it's got a low return big volatility so uh, why when you, you add that does it improve the total portfolio and that really is the essence of modern portfolio theory which is correlation or covariance if commodities will often do well when you know stocks or bonds or the like are doing poorly right and just before we take a break here, uh, uh, somebody comes into your office, they've got X amount of money, uh, and you've got to go through the investment policy statement. What is that, and, and what kind of questions do you ask this potential investor? Um, I mean, the essence of good investing is always to have your own strategy. So, and that starts with a good strategy document, but it's the input into that. 
And in our world, people come in with a risk capacity, which is their ability to take on risk, age, uh, time horizon, liquidity needs, cash flow, tax. But just as important is risk attitude. And on uh, the risk attitude, you get into that ability to handle losses. And we actually work through with clients you know, uh, historically to right. take them through markets and say, how, how you know, can you withstand a certain loss? And so the second might be more important than the first. So you, you do the equivalent of scenario testing that we hear institutional investors talk about all the time. And I suppose a lot of investors found out in 2008 what kind of investors they really were. But in your case, you would have already walked them through that scenario in advance to say, can you stomach this kind of volatility? Well, it's great you bring that up. We specifically made sure that we had seven, 1973 and 74 in our, in our history of, because that was a 50% market decline, actually 21 months. A grinding bear market. We, I mean, this was a shock bear market. But over the two years, the losses were very similar to the loss of 08 or 09. So if you decided, let's say I can take a 20% loss, and we don't use percentages, we like to use dollar amounts because, you know, a $5 million, so I might take a million dollars. You've actually made an explicit decision on the risk you're prepared to take as opposed to having a nasty surprise. All right, Michael, we'll take a short break here. Uh, stay with us. We'll find out uh, if investors need a new playbook to make profit in the new normal. That's coming up. Welcome back to Alternative Investing. I'm here with my co-host, David Coffin, the president of Westcourt Capital. Now, this week, uh, the topic is how to find yield as volatility and big swings become the new normal. Uh, back with us again is Michael Nairn. He's the president of Tacita Capital. Let's talk about uh, where we are uh, in equity markets right now. What do you think? Well, the equity markets actually, although they've been obviously hugely volatile, are for the first time in over a decade at a global level starting to get kind of reasonably priced where there's, you know, actually the prospect of kind of mid high single digit returns. That's starting to put a buffer and actually opportunity in the markets that hasn't been there since the, you know, the uh, overvaluation of the tech bubble. And of course, uh, one reason that people in equities is for dividends, but dividends alone are not going to produce the kind of yields that investors need to live on. And so normally that's taken up by the fixed income markets. Of course, the fixed income markets that we see today are at historically uh, low returns, which means that you have the double whammy of low returns and potentially degradation of your capital as, as rates uh, eventually increase. So uh, where you can talk a little bit about where the long-term yields are and then discuss wh where do I find the yield? Okay. The, uh, I mean, long-term yields are... are sitting at a low since World War II, and they've come down across the world. And, and it, it, it really is a disappearance, not only of the inflation premium that's normally in bonds, but also the real return. The result is, particularly for retirees, the price of safety is very high. And in this kind of environment, individuals have to begin looking at broader diversification. So you're, again, looking into the REITs or utility stocks, or uh, you know, other asset classes that can actually provide a total return picture that will keep that portfolio bolstered. And as, as people look in, the, in that direction, uh, they, 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 it, it can't just be something that's going to have appreciation because they need that yield in real time. So, I mean, you, you mentioned REITs, which of course do pay yield in real time, but have the kind of volatility associated with the market if they're, if they're publicly traded. We're going to talk a little bit later about liquidity, but uh, what kind of private investments, you mentioned commodities earlier, maybe managed futures, should people be looking at in terms to, uh, I guess, generate some kind of yield? Well, everything in good portion, but REITs, REITs are definitely one. The, the second one is in private mortgage pools today, uh, properly run our you know, they have a lot of credit risk. That's why the return's high. But well run, they are bring in kind of a different form of credit risk in a portfolio so they can both provide yield and diversification. Now, Michael, do you think that the 30-year uh, the bond rally is, is over? We've been hearing that for a couple of years and haven't, hasn't quite happened yet. Uh, I don't think it, it may not be over because we may see the Fed now extend their duration of their holdings and that they're, they may even continue to try and pull down that long bond rate a bit. And there may even be some of the anticipation of that in the market. But barring a deflationary collapse around the world, 
we are in a bottoming out process. You know, since 1792, there's been 11 bond cycles of bond bear, bond bear. We've just gone through the greatest bull market of all time in bonds. As yes, we see here with uh, the yields falling dramatically since uh, 1981, since the Reagan years. Absolutely. Yeah. What's, what people forget is in 1946, yields were 2.5% and went all the way up to 14% in the worst bear market of all time. So the bonds have a lot of risk in them today. Let's, yeah, especially when, when you consider, I suppose it's possible for yields to go negative in a theoretical sense, but it's highly unlikely. We've seen that the Fed has purchased $2.3 trillion in long-term debt you know, over the last two years for QE1 and QE2. Uh, there's not a lot of tools left in the toolkit. If you had to bet, uh, I suppose, to Mark's point, that the, the bull run may not be over, but there, how much possible room is there left to go as we near zero? Well, we always ask ourselves one question. First, stay diversified. But within that, as you look to an asset class, am I going to tilt away or towards it? Right. Am I being paid for the risk? So you got lots of interest rate risk and very little payment you know, why would you tilt in that direction in a portfolio? Now, uh, what's your opinion of uh, so-called stores of value like gold, like, like real estate? Uh, how involved are your clients in those areas? Um, it's funny because all my life I've been, let's, I've, all my life I've actually had a good allocation to real estate and believe that for 30 years. And that's been a, a winning investment in this past decade in particular because low interest rates, there's actually a bit of a bond effect in, in real estate. So, and, you know, we're still very uh, positive on it because of the underlying dynamics. Uh, gold, after many years, I've, we finally began putting in our portfolios in 2007 solely as a result of its negative correlation. It can really do well when things are doing poorly. And in a world of fiat money and lots of debt and lots of instability, it, it can have a portfolio role. University of Te Texas just put money in, like some of the institutional people. About a billion dollars, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. But a small, small portions, because mm -hmm. it's for insurance. The long-term return of gold since 1802 or whatever, uh, Siegel did numbers, 0.66% real return. So, which, which makes yeah. sense. The, the, the real return of gold should be, you know, on, on, on a purchasing value should be essentially zero because the whole point is that a, uh, a bar of gold will buy, you know, so many automobiles all the time irrespective of where we are in, in that stage because an analyst such as yourself must have a difficult time buying a commodity like gold that has relatively few uses other than this store value that everyone seems to agree on. It's got, a, it's got an, an insurance role and it, it, it correlates most, most with negative real interest rates. So when interest rates go, start to go up, you know, bonds, could, uh, gold could come under, under real pressure. Although, of course, in the U.S., they're pledging to keep them uh, That's near right. historically low levels, almost zero for another couple of years. Um, now, we're talking about the new normal here. We have extreme volatility. Uh, is, is the old playbook, uh, it just doesn't apply anymore? Well, it's funny because Dave and I were talking about that earlier. It's kind of like the new normal is really the old and frequent normal. Because if you take a look at the stock market, about 3% of the time, you will have months that have a 10% loss or more. August 98, Russian, October 87, March 9, May 1940, when the Germans invaded France, 24% loss. So you have these kind of big event months that occur three out of 100 times. We just always forget. So the important part about knowing about that is the best playbook is always thoughtful diversification that's customized to your particular needs, and I'm talking again at this robust asset class level. That playbook is still in, in play. All right. Very good, Michael. We'll take another short break here. Stay with us. Uh, we're going to uh, look at how to mitigate downside risk in your portfolio. That's coming up. David Kaufman is one of Canada's leading experts on alternative investing. He is the president of Westcourt Capital, a registered exempt market dealer. Welcome back to Alternative Investing. I'm here with David Kaufman, the president of Westcourt Capital. And with us still is Michael Nairn. He's president of Tacita Capital. We've been discussing the so-called new normal when it comes to investing. Now we'll look at the capital preservation and controlling the downside risk. Uh, obviously, you want to preserve capital for your clients. What are the tools that you use to protect the downside for them? Well, you know, the, the first, as we discussed, is really understanding the risk they can take. 
And then you begin to work, and you, there's lots of statistical tools, using the various asset classes, you know, in terms of bonds, uh, type of equity, to build in a, a, an asset class composition that's right for them. Nowadays, they're, with the explosion in the exchange-traded funds and the rise of so many alternative uh, strategies, and, uh, there is a lot more to work with to diversify than, than was available 20 years ago. So that if, so if somebody has a large equity exposure, let's just say they have a low tax base. A lot of people have legacy equities yep. that they might have inherited, and there's these very low tax bases on them. So, I mean, selling down to, to, to reduce the exposure may not be a very practical solution. So what you're saying is that we can buy, for example, ETS, which might have an inverse relationship, or other kinds of more sophisticated portfolio insurance. You know, we talked last week about uh, covered call, uh, yep. or selling puts, whatever it may be, buying puts, whatever it may be that you can achieve that, but to, it's all about the diversification, is that right? Well, yeah, it starts with that strategy, and then if you get elements in terms of change of circumstances or taxes, and in some you might use an inverse ETF, brings in certain, you know, as a, as a tool, or you might short. I mean, shorting was uh, exotic 10 years ago. Now you can open an account with a short account and, and take off some of that equity exposure without triggering maybe a big capital gain on a concentrated stock position. And let me just return to the beginning of that answer where you talked about you know their capacity for risk and then you had spoken earlier about their, uh, their, their sort of the fear index for each person, what they're willing yeah. to assume. Uh, at different points in their cycle, different people are willing to assume different risks. But what I wonder is that as they walk into your office and they think that they have a diversified portfolio because they have the S&P and the TSX or they have five mutual funds or whatever it is, how much of a shock is it that on the one hand they say capital preservation is my number one objective, then they show you the portfolio, and how hard is it for you to explain to them that they have significantly more risk built into their existing portfolio than they thought? Unless you take it and begin to show and back test it and say, so you've just had these three asset classes, because you can take it to that kind of level, and then show them over the past 20 or 30 years how that diverged from a better diversified, then you get people's interest, because that becomes a simple chart. And Michael, what about private investments, the ones that are, are not listed? Do, do some of your clients maybe get lulled into a, a false sense of security, thinking, well, they're, they're, not, uh, they're not that volatile, uh, you know, they're fairly safe? Is that incorrect to think that way? Yeah, I, I, if, you're, if you move out of the, what we call the mark-to-market world, where you know, you're priced every day in a competitive market, it's easy to put G, you know, a five-year GIC or a, or a private equity holding or a piece of real estate down. Well. I can tell you in October 2008, doesn't matter what you're carrying on your books for real estate, that was a no-bid market. So it can give a false illusion, and people can get very comfortable, particularly real estate investors, with an asset that's actually riskier than what they think just because of the bookkeeping. Right, right, but to that point, you know, you have to then, of course, manage fear and the way people react to it because it, over a 30-year or 50-year time horizon, a public read and a private read are going to, assuming that they have the same management, are going to perform exactly the same way. But in shorter periods of time, two months, four months, six months, when you see the volatility, uh, if people sell at the wrong time in the public markets, the fact that those securities were liquid is not necessarily doing them any favors, is it? Uh, no, it isn't. In fact, you know, there's a, there's a lot to be said for, as the... You know, some people say I only look at my account statement every 10 years because then I'm always happy. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unless, unless they're looking at it from 01 to 11. And well, not it. if they're well diversified. <laughs> ah, right. Now, speaking of being well diversified, uh, there are sort of, I won't call them exotic, but a little bit more outside the mainstream alternative investments. We'll leave art and wine to another, yeah, another yeah. discussion. But there are managed futures, which, as we discussed on this show, are very big in Europe and not as big uh, yet in Canada. Of course, private equity, people own their own businesses yeah. or they invest in other people's. We've got farmland, timberland, other structured products. So if someone is talking to you about diversifying in a, in a real, in a, in a significant way, how do you explain to them how the diversified benefits of those and, and the correlation with things like inflation, the public markets, and how that calculus should be uh, done? For us, many of those are alternative sources of risk and yield enhancement. So we don't view private equity as being frankly, less risky than public equity. In fact, because it's leveraged, it often might even be, it has that stability we talked about in terms of bookkeeping because right. it's valuation-based. But what it does do is leverages, first is somebody's lending you money non-recourse. That's worth something. Number two, you know, if you can get real talent in the private equity world, they can augment return. Um, farmland or, 
or timber that can be good diversifiers. What you have to be careful with is again, who's the operator? You know, you know, what's their track record? What's their ability to really deliver in the promise? And then the you know the higher transaction costs. So let's talk about that for a second. The idea of operational risk within within a fund, because even if we diversify among asset classes, you're not suggesting, of course, that that alone is enough. You still worry about uh, choosing the best funds within each asset class. And operational risk can really only be diversified by investing in more than one fund. I presume that you're not just going to pick the best in class and, and uh, bet on red and, and let it go, right? Well, yeah, yeah, there's a couple of things. I mean, if you're in, over in individual strategy like hedge funds or direct real estate, you need to go and find out you know, what their risk management is, their departments, and how they run that, their risk parameters, and really be comfortable with that. You should not be investing in those kind of investments without that operational due diligence. Either do it yourself, get somebody to do it. And then number two, you're exactly right. Even at that level, you've got to diversify up. That's why you know most Serious hedge fund people will have anywhere from you know kind of ten to thirty different hedge funds in their portfolio. Yeah, so I mean ten, ten to thirty—that's a very big number. So that's why they need someone like you. I mean, I, I presume that someone cannot spend their entire life doing nothing but due diligence on hedge funds. So they need to come to someone that can tell the difference between the best ones and the ones that maybe are not as great. Yeah, yeah particularly in the hedge fund world because hedge fund compensation is so attractive that. Everybody says they're a hedge fund really when they're just a directional leverage bet, right? A hedge fund in our world is a diversifier, either through correlation or, or volatility control, and can add to tor total portfolio return, but you, you really need somebody who knows what they're, they're doing. Right. Michael, thanks so much for coming in today. Thank you. We really enjoyed your perspective. Thanks. And David, this is the end of our run. It's yes. our last show, but uh, viewers can still contact you at your, your website. And uh, check you out on Twitter as well. Are you sure. a big tw a tweeter? I tweet uh, five to ten times a day. All right. Keep people apprised of what's going on. I, I must say, uh, I learned a lot on this show, and I know you said off air that you did as well. We, we really had some great guests like Michael, and uh, I'm hoping the viewers uh, really came away with a, a good sense of uh, alternative investing and how to uh, diversify. Uh, you know, the guests really made, made the show what it is because there's so many very, very smart people running very interesting and complex strategies you know, on Bay Street and across Canada, uh, a lot of which uh, can diversify portfolios to help people with their returns. I'd like to thank you for, for co-hosting along with uh, Andy Bell earlier in the show. Yeah. Uh, the production staff have been wonderful to put up with us, uh, and also uh, the viewers, of course, because they've given us some great feedback, great ideas on, on uh, topics for different shows, and it's, uh, it's been a terrific ride, and I really appreciate the opportunity to have done this. Yeah, I've enjoyed it, and uh, just to be clear here, your website is westcourtcapital.com, and uh, Twitter, you're what, westcourtcap, right? At westcourtcap. Twitter at westcourtcap, very good. All right, Wonderful. we'll see you. Thanks again, Michael, and uh, thanks a lot for joining us on Alternative Investing, and uh, we say goodbye.